All right, well, Super Bowl Sunday. So anyway, let's, uh, anything else you want to talk about? Come on now. All right, let's do this. I do this every Super Bowl, so let's take a little poll. Patriots fans, who are you? Again with the shirt, Michael. You just show up at just the right time. Patriots fan. Any Eagles fans out there? Anyone? Anyone? You? And then this crowd. Don't care. <laughs> wow, that's always the most popular. We're in the South, people. We do SEC. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, well, uh, I'm sure that you'll find some place to land and eat some horrible food and watch the Super Bowls. It'll be great. It's good stuff. All right, um, today we're in week two of a message series that we started last week, just called simply WGS. And uh, that stands for Worship Groups and Serving. Um, so many people have asked me, what is the WGS on your sign? What does it mean? Does it stand for WUGS? You know, what is that? And it's like, no, it's not WUGS. And worship groups and serving. And so, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about that around here. And so we thought it'd be good to spend three weeks just talking about it as part of our strategy. And, and then around tables that are meeting during the week, you know, also using that as an opportunity to talk about what this is all about. And, and um, so Lee did a great job last week of starting this series off and kind of giving us all a big picture of what it's about and that it really is for us a discipleship strategy. You know, we really believe that if people will be involved regularly in worship, and as Lee said last week, you know, this time that we share on Sunday morning is good and important and we need it, but there's also that time in between. So worship is not only relegated to Sunday morning. We also need to be worshiping throughout the week. And really, we worship with everything that we do. You know, we give that all to God in some form or fashion. And sometimes how Sunday morning goes is determined by how well we've worshiped throughout the week. So um, we want to do that well. And then, you know, groups are a vital part of, of who we are and what we do. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. And serving is so important. And we believe that if people can be involved regularly in worship in some sort of a group and in serving God regularly, that, that this is a way to follow Jesus. And also, if we all do this together as a church, this helps us carry out our mission of leading people to know and serve Jesus. And so it is an important part of what we do. Uh, so Lee talked about worship last week. Um, if you missed that, you can go online and, and watch the podcast and, and catch up. Today, I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about groups and why we believe groups are important and why we invite you to be a part of them. Uh, you know, there's a, a phrase that just simply says, we are better together. And, you know, really in so many ways, that's true in most areas of our life. You know, we're just better together. You know, we can get so much more done. We, we feel more encouraged when we have other people helping us do whatever we're doing. You know, going through school, I can remember that uh, some of the times that I love the best <clears throat> is when our teachers put us into groups to do a project. That was my favorite, mostly because hopefully we had somebody who was really intelligent in that group, and we would get a really good grade as a group so they could carry me through that process. But nonetheless, I loved it because I actually learned better by being in a group and by hearing other people talk about whatever it was we were working on and kind of figuring out how they study and how they do what they're doing. And, and so, you know, it's like this whole idea of just that group being together is so vital. It, um, the Bible talks all about it all the way throughout the Old Testament into the New Testament. And uh, so what we want to do is just go ahead and go back into Scripture and look at um, how it was important for the early church, why it mattered to them, and why it still matters to us today. So we're going to go back today into Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, uh, you'll want to go there. We're going to be looking at those verses that we talked about last week, 42 through 47. And then uh, you can flip on over to Hebrews chapter 10, 23 to 25. I'll get there uh, in just a minute. So the early church was forming in Acts chapter 2. Um, you know, the Holy Spirit had come, Pentecost had happened, and uh, had empowered the followers of Christ to now begin to form as the church to carry out uh, sharing the gospel around the world. And, and so what we have here in these verses is really a snapshot of what it looked like for that first gathering of believers in church. You know, what did they do and why was it important? So let me read that and then we'll talk about it. It says, first of all, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, we could just stop right there because there's so much just in that very first verse. And the, and the word that sticks out to me is just the word devoted. You know, they were deeply devoted 
to the teaching, to being together, to, um, to sharing meals together. That was an important part of what it meant for them to do life together and to praying together. They would do whatever it took to be with the group. You know, it's like they're sitting home Sunday afternoon, and they know they got to go to the group, and they were tired, but boy, they got up and they went. You know, it, it didn't matter what was going on in their life. They found a way to be together because it was better that they were doing these things together. So let's keep going. Verse 44, it says, All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. <clears throat> now, this, this part right here is always interesting to me, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You see, they didn't have an evangelism strategy. They didn't have a website. They weren't doing marketing. You know, they weren't sending teams out to evangelize people door to door, any of those kinds of things in that day. What they were doing is just doing well what they were supposed to be doing together. And because of that, people looked at that and said, I want to be a part of that. So it says they, they went to the temple courts. They worshiped together. And you know, another word that stands out in here is together. It shows up over and over again in these verses. They went to the temple courts, you know, as a group, and they worshiped together. That was their weekly worship. And then between Sundays or whatever day they were worshiping on together, they would gather, it says, in each other's homes. And they would eat together, and they would celebrate together, and they would pray together. And, and all of these good things happen uh, in these group settings um, that they had all throughout the week. And it was important that they did these things. This is what helped them carry out the mission that God had given them. And then if you go over to Hebrews 10, you see a little bit of a different take on, on this group life. The writer is writing to a group of Christians who have been isolated, and uh, churches who are out there and who are struggling against all the pagan world and all that was going on, they were being persecuted, and, and they, were, um, they were really discouraged and were actually giving up. And so he writes to them in a different way, and he says in Hebrews 10, 23 to 25, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And so he's writing to these group of Christians. He's saying, listen, I get it. I know it's hard and that you're being persecuted and it's a struggle to be a Christian where you are. But giving up meeting together is not a good way to deal with that. <laughs> that is the very thing that you should be doing because you need to encourage each other to keep the faith. You need to encourage each other to keep doing the hard things, you know, all this kind of stuff. We need to keep meeting together. And he uses an interesting word here. He talks about spurring one another on. And the word spur in Greek is spur. <laughs> it just means the same thing that we think of. Like on a turkey or on a rooster or something, there's a spur on their leg, right? And that is used to defend themselves and to do all kinds of stuff. Or like you put spurs on your boots. That's designed to encourage the horse, right? We're encouraging the horse to get moving, you know? We want to encourage him to move forward. Spurring one another on, like challenging each other. Sometimes we need to be challenged to do the right thing, to sort of stay the course. You know, we need to be challenged to keep working at that thing that is so good, but maybe we've gotten tired of. And that's what he was telling them, that you, need to, you need to keep being together because if you're not together, it's hard to do that alone. In, um, in so many ways, you know, the, uh, to be, I just feel like that my Christian faith is so much better because I have other people that I'm doing this life with. And it's like when we were brought onto this earth, we were literally hardwired and designed to be with other people. Um, there's a story about a guy who's traveling through the South. He's from Michigan. And uh, he gets up one morning, goes to the restaurant, he's going to eat breakfast. And he gets there and he opens up the menu and, and he sees grits. And he's like, oh man, I'm so excited. I've always heard about grits. I'd love to try them. And so the waitress comes over and, and he looks at her and and uh, he's thinking about ordering, but he asks her a question. He says, hey, let me ask you a question. What, what exactly is a grit? And she was like, well, honey, they call them grits because they don't come by themselves. And he's like, okay, I'll just have some of those. You know what I mean? That was the end of that. And it's the same thing. It's like, you know what? When we came here, we didn't come by ourselves. We didn't. 
get placed on this earth alone. We came with lots of other people that we were to connect with along life's journey. You know, like that is a part of how we have been designed. And so, you know, we're supposed to be doing this together by, by God's design. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm like a lot of people. There, there are moments in my life where I would love to take Becky and just go out to Montana, get in the cabin, fly fish and hunt for the rest of my life and live off the land, baby. Just be by myself, you know? I mean, maybe we all have those moments. Maybe you don't, but I do. But I know what would happen. After about two months of that, I'd be like, let's go back. Because you know what? I'd love to be around people every now and again. The squirrels, I'm talking to them. They're not talking back anymore. You know, it's like that group life I'm having is not good. Uh, but, you know, because that's how that works. There's this, like, void in our life that is filled by being with other people. And, um, and that's something that, that God put in us, and that's good, and, and we need to do that. So in light of that, and in light of uh, what we're learning in Acts 2 and from Hebrews and all these kinds of things, so what does it mean to be a part of group life? Like, if you're thinking about, if you've been in a group, you already know a lot of these things, but if you're thinking about, like, what, what do I get out of that? So, so here's a few things that we think about. Number one is, it's this idea of fellowship. And, you know, we say that word, and, and it seems so trite to say, it. oh, you know, we fellowship, there's, you know, we go to do fellowship, and all this kind of stuff. But in the early days, in the early church, fellowship was something that was vital for them. And it says in there, they devoted themselves to the fellowship. And they would do whatever it takes to make sure that they were at meetings with other people, that they were having moments where they were around people. They were deeply committed to making this happen. It was very, very important to them. And and so to, to do fellowship, that means that they ate together, they got to know one another, they laughed together, they cried together, you know, they, they, so many things happen when we genuinely fellowship with one another. And you know, you just, there are just moments, I'm sure you've had it, where you've just been with good friends or you've been around people and you left just going, oh man, that was just so good. I mean, it wasn't amazing what happened and there wasn't any big thing, but you just loved being with them. It was just good time. It, that's what fellowship is, is this thing that we know it when we have it. And being a part of a group helps make that happen. I'm already hearing great things about our tables that are meeting during the weeks right now. And you know how just the being together, eating together, and getting to know new people is just such a good thing. And so um, Webster's Dictionary describes fellowship as this, companionship or the community of interest, like people who are together for a reason, a unified body of people who are of equal rank or sharing in common interests, goals, et cetera, partnership. You know, all those things happen in that sense of fellowship. And, and really to me, you know, today, in this day and age, it, it just matters so much because it, it goes against a lot of what we experience, which can be like isolation, individualism, you know, the sense of I don't need people, I, want to, I just want to be by myself, or that like I can substitute something like Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or something, like I can substitute that for actually being with people. Well, you know what, even Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook has come out lately and said, maybe Facebook hasn't been actually that great for us. Maybe it hasn't actually brought people together the way we originally thought it would be. And we already know that. We, we cannot substitute that for being together, you know, by genuinely doing that face-to-face -face thing. And in the Bible, the word, the actual Greek word that they use for fellowship is called koinonia. Share that with your friends this week at work. Koinonia, man, I learned that at church. It's two things. One, to share together, to share whatever, to share life together, share burdens together, share struggles or joys, all that, to share together, and then to share with. In other words, to be willing to share with somebody else. And, and that was played out in those passages there with the early church. Was, and it said they had everything in common. Everything I have is yours. You know, everything you know, we all have, we're going to share that together. And anybody who has need in this group, we're going to make sure that within the group, we're going to get it taken care of. They were selling land and possessions and doing like whatever it took to genuinely help each other out because fe uh, this fellowship, this koinonia is about sharing with somebody else or maybe somebody sharing something with you. And, uh, and that was an important part of what it meant for them to be together. Now, I get lots of people every now and again who come to me and say, <clears throat> well, Rusty, can I, I mean, can I just be a Christian and go worship in the deer stand or, you know, can I just worship on the golf course? You know, can, can I just be, you know, can I just do that? And like, first of all, I have never played a round of golf that I felt up to worshiping in that moment, you know. There's mostly a lot of confession and repentance that happens on the golf course, you know. There's not a whole lot of like, oh, yeah, there's the occasional, like, shot where you're just like, that was God. Thank you, Lord. That's not even real. But anyway, 
But you know what I tell you, people? Yes. Yes, you can worship on the golf course. Yes, you can worship in the deer stand. Yes, you should. But you can't substitute that for meeting together with other believers on a Sunday or during the week in a group. You see, that's the difference there. Because you need those people. And here's another thing. It's not all about us. Because there are people who need you. They need your life experience. They need your story. They need to hear your struggle or the way that you follow Christ. Like, there's also that too. When you're not with other people, they're missing you. And so this, this fellowship part of this is just something that, that is so valuable. And even Jesus did it. I mean, come on. He gathered 12 people around him. He certainly didn't have to do that as God. But as a human, he knew he needed it. And he spent a lot of time just sharing life with people, eating together and, and uh, laughing together and all those kinds of things because he knew it was important. So if it's important enough for him, it's important enough for us, right? All right, good. I didn't hear any all rights, but that's all right. I believe you. I believe you're with me, right? So fellowship is about three other ships. <clears throat> Got to get that word right. Relationship, partnership, companionship. And those are all parts of that same thing. Okay, secondly, another part of this is so important. It's just this idea of support. And I don't mean in the sense of like our groups are support groups, but I do hope that support is happening within the group. And to genuinely be supported is a big part of this, doing this journey together, like genuinely lifting each other up and carrying each other's burdens and putting our arms around each other when it's hard, you know, all that kind of stuff. And like the writer in Hebrews says, sometimes we just need to be spurred on or we need to spur somebody else on toward love and good deeds. We need to encourage somebody. We need to say those words to them, you know, like, hey, be encouraged. It's okay. You keep doing what you're doing, you know. You keep going. Or sometimes we get stuck in a place where we just don't feel like we move. We're stuck by some fear, you know, something that happened. You know how sometimes you make mountains out of molehills? Have you ever done that? Something happened, and it was kind of bad, but in your mind, you went all the way to the possible worst scenario that could ever happen, and, like, life is over. Something happened to your finances. Like, oh, no, we're going to be broke living on the streets, dragging our kids around Auburn forever. You know, you know I can't believe this happened. Oh, I got a bad grade. You know, this kind of stuff. All right, well, I got an illustration. Let's pull this up here. So here's kind of how this goes when you find that situation. So point A over here is, man, I got a C on my exam. To be totally illogical is to leap all the way over to this horrible situation here at point B, which is Z-O-M-G. Don't know that? Zonk? No, that's not what it is. Anyway, the world is over. Like, that's what the totally illogical leap that sometimes we do when we just get so, you know, man, I'm so worried about what just happened. Now, here's the semi-logical links that get you over here. I could lose my scholarship. Then that would mean I'll have to take out more loans. Then the world is over. So, you know, but most of the time we just go from point A to point B, and it's just all horrible, and we're never going to make it. And it's just like, ah! So that's how it happens for me. <laughs> you all look like I've never seen that before. Anyway, there's a word for this. It's called catastrophizing. That's a real word by legitimate people who make up words. Like that's a real one. <clears throat> that could actually happen to us. We catastrophize about a lot of things. Or, you know, something bad happens and it's like Godzilla, man. He's just like stomping down your world and he's breathing fire and he's burning down everything. You're like, this is my old, everything's crumbling. And then you actually get through it and you look back on what just happened and it was just a little Geico lizard. It really wasn't that bad, you know? <laughs> You're like, oh, look, it wasn't that bad, you know, whatever. Or you think about, I got to go have this hard conversation. It's going to be horrible. They're going to just chew me up, spit me out. And then on the other side, you go, oh, he was just a Geico lizard. It wasn't too bad, you know? You see what I'm saying? All right, everybody got the point. Well, so a lot of times the reason that we find ourselves in this horrible place of just running this around in our mind is because we do it by ourselves. I mean, really. Most of the worries and fears that keep us captive are because we just keep letting it rattle around in our brain and we don't tell anybody. We don't reach out to anybody. And they just grow into Godzilla over time, you know? But it's amazing how when we get together with some other people and if we're courageous enough to share that struggle or to open that up to them, man, through that conversation, it's amazing what can happen. Somebody else goes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Like literally, I just went through this. Or last year we had the same struggle. And it was hard, but here's kind of what we did. All of a sudden, back to God, go lizard. It's not too bad. I mean, people start helping you and talking you through it. And next thing you know, it's that support, that moment where you go, man, other people struggle like me? Awesome. <laughs> you know, it's like, there's hope. I'm going to be okay. I'm not as bad as I thought I was. 
those people are really bad. <laughs> Sometimes you do get those stories in group settings. Like, whoa, man, that really feels great. But anyway, being with other people is just that thing where we get that encouragement. And what word is embedded within the word encouragement? Y'all are so good. Courage. Courage. Because more often than not, what we need is some courage to go do whatever it is we got to do that looks so hard and looks so big. You know, we need somebody to helping us out because really we're just stronger together, more courageous. And then just kind of this last idea, something that happens and that happened in the early church should be happening among us in these settings is you know, just learning together. Um, part of this process of following Christ is, is learning how to do that well. It's, it's literally opening up, opening up the Bible, reading what God is trying to tell us, talking about it and how it relates to our lives, sharing about the way that this has impacted you and, and you sharing with me, you know, the way it's impacted your life and me hearing your story and your experience of Christ. And, and in doing that, this sort of shared learning thing happens. And all educators know there's just something good about shared learning and that we should do that. And so in that early church, most learning was passed on by word of mouth. Very little of it was actually written down. Most of it was just FaceTime, you know. It's where you were modeling the faith to me and I was learning it and then I was going out and doing it. It was that kind of a process that was so important. There's actually something, a, a, a learning process called elbow learning. And um, this goes all the way back to a story about Antonio Stradivarius. You know who that is? What did he make? Violins, the Stradivarius. And so, um, you know, he made those amazing violins and he did so with such a unique process of construction of the violin that uh, for years nobody knew how he did it. They couldn't figure out how he could get that kind of tone that was so good and so rich out of that violin and, and they studied it for the longest time and then they became this very priceless thing which now they think we only have about 500 left in the world and one sold about seven years ago for 3.6 million dollars so that's a big deal. But the, the process of making them was so unique. Recently, researchers have discovered, they think they've got the process figured out and all the things that go into making it. Now, one thing that was interesting to me is that the varnish is like this homemade, handmade varnish from gum, Arabic, honey, and egg white. Man, you could lick a Stradivarius. That'd be good. That'd be awesome. But anyway, that's gross. So, but, so they, they kind of figured this out, but what they really discovered is why are they having such a hard time figuring this out? Because he never wrote anything down. He never wrote down how to build a Stradivarius, how to finish it, how to make it. For him, everything was passed on. And so he would get students around him when he was constructing one of these violins, and he would make them sit elbow to elbow in a circle. That's why it's called elbow learning. And, and he would literally, like, put it together and he would explain how he was putting it together and why he cut it this way and why this varnish is made of this and why he's rubbing it this many times and he would literally build the whole thing right in front of him because to him that's the only way you can learn is face to face listening and watching seeing it happen and clearly it, it's still a thing for us today, you know, in, in this modern age of this technology and the way we're just typing everything, you know, to everybody. We're texting everybody. But, but we still need this face-to-face. -face. And I think many times we need face-to-face -to, -face to get it right. I mean, how many times have you texted somebody and they received it in a way you didn't mean it? And then you had a weird texting situation go on there? You know what I'm talking about? You're like, well, I didn't mean to say it that way. Well, you said it in the text that way, and it's just like, oh, gosh. Well, maybe if we had just said it to each other, it would have come out very clear because I saw how you said it. Like, there's something valuable about that. And so this, this learning thing happened among uh, the early followers of Christ who were listening to the disciples' teaching, and it's still happening today. And while what we do here on Sunday morning, what we're doing literally right now in learning together is really good, but it's not nearly as good as what can happen when we get with a, a smaller group of people in a different environment where we get to ask questions and talk about what's going on and we can do sort of some, some back and forth conversation. And, um, so anyway, so all of these things are vital, you know, to, to experiencing this group life, you know, um, that having that fellowship together, supporting one another, learning together. And so just I want to leave you with this from Ecclesiastes, back in the Old Testament. Ecclesiastes 4, he just says it so well here, this whole idea of being together. He says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If one of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. 
Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. The best part there, a cord of three strands, not quickly broken. We are just stronger and better together. So I guess my challenge for all of us is really just a question, who is your together? Who is that for you? You know, we might even say, well, it's my, my spouse, and my kids, and, and that's great because we need them for all of these things. But I would say families, married couples, you need other couples to be meeting with in your life, uh, sharing together, encouraging each other, all those kinds of things as well. And um, I just think that's important that we find our together. Now, I'm going to leave you with much more of a practical step. If you're looking at taking a next step into this whole group life situation, you've not done that before. One thing that you could do right now, um, we've been talking about tables for the last several weeks, and these are just gatherings in people's homes for fellowship and encouragement and eating together and praying together and all those kinds of things. Um, You can still be a part of a table. Uh, Just go to our website, click on tables, and find the ones that's closest to you and sign up for it. And uh, you can do that for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we are kind of hoping that some of these tables, and it looks like they are, are going to develop into new groups. So, um, so that will be one way to step into group life. And then uh, let me kind of describe another option for you. And we've made a, a, a little bit of a change to how we do groups. Um, and that's going to be coming out very soon. So um, <clears throat> we've got right now, we've got these 18 to 24-month groups, which are, you know, much more long-term. And we've had a lot of people who've just been like, eh, man, I just don't know if I can meet together for that kind of a commitment for that long. But I would be willing to step into something that was shorter term. So we're like, all right, let's do that. So on the left, we've got the community groups, which are going to be eight-week short-term groups. And they're going to be based on things like topics or passions that you have or hobbies that you have. In other words, if you're somebody who loves to run, gather a bunch of other people around you who love to run, and you all run. And when you get back, pray together. Have a short devotional together. See how that goes for eight weeks, and who knows, that may develop into a much more long-term group or whatever that hobby or that interest is that you have. We're going to be asking people to be willing to lead those types of groups. Again, the commitment to be a part of it is only eight weeks, although it could develop into what's going to be now called a life group, which will be 18 to 24 months of of doing life together in a different way. Um, So these new eight-week community groups are going to be coming online March 18th that week, and you'll be hearing much more about that, but we're excited about that. That'll give people a a step, not a leap into groups, but much more of a step. And so if you're looking for that next step, we'd love for you to take that. And Suzanne is going to be up at the end to close us out. And she'll talk just a little bit more about that in just a minute. But um, but wanted you to have that as a way that you could uh, maybe begin to explore what it means to to be a part of group life here. Because for us, it is literally one third of what we do as a church, worship groups and serving. And so it's an important part of really jumping in with us. So I want to leave you with the question. It's on your card that you got when you came in this morning. It just says this, where am I experiencing life together in Christian community? And in light of this, what next steps do I need to take? And so um, I hope that you'll just begin to consider that even now. Let's pray pray as we close up.